Oh, okay, okay, good, good. Yeah. I was looking for the clock so I'd know be, be able to watch the time there, and I uh, thought I'd <coughs> miss that. <coughs> it's good to be here this morning. How are you all doing? Hey, Amen for being here. Yeah. <laughs> yes, indeed. Did everybody get a prayer card? One of our cards? Everybody, anybody not get one? Yeah. Three years, uh, but for some reason they never took care of it. I guess they had bought a piece of property and built themselves a larger building, so maybe they just weren't worried about it anymore. So when we bought that in March, uh, we went in and were ripping out the ceiling tiles, and there had been rats running up and down through the ceiling, and we ripped out, uh, you know, had some plywood or whatever on the wall and ripped that off, and the rats were still there. And they were kind of jumping out, and the kids, my kids and other kids, chasing them down and killing them. And they thought that was the grandest thing, you know. <laughs> like, wow, you know. <clears throat> and uh, it was slanted like this, and so we, <clears throat> we were going to pull it straight and then reinforce the roof with, you know, new struts and things or whatever, you know, whatever your rafters and whatnot. Uh, <clears throat> and so... A friend brought a backhoe. We put some heavy cables from one side to the other, big bolts and stuff, and they tied that to the backhoe somehow or another. And then that bucket just went, zzz, pulled it like that, you know, and the building went up straight. Then we couldn't close the doors. <laughs> so we had to let it go back a little bit <laughs> so the doors would <laughs> shut. <laughs> So I walk in here and it's like, this is gorgeous, man. I, <laughs> I love this. This is awesome. I tell you, and uh, God's been so good. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, it's, it's the building's fun. And uh, if you could have seen pictures before and after, on the outside, I mean, the paint was all peeling off and it just looked horrendous, like it would have been abandoned for years and years. They'd only been out of it about four months. I mean, <laughs> they were in it just that way. And this corner over here, there was a big leak in the, in the roof, and it was just coming down through to the platform and stuff like that. And they just lived with it like that. They just thought that was normal, I guess. And uh, <clears throat> we were, you know, we, we bought it. Uh, church paid for it, and, and uh, we were making repairs. But we didn't have a whole lot of money for repairs, and and uh, another local pastor came over and he's a dear friend to us and he knows something about construction and he brought workers and then we had some workers as well and he'd say well, we're going to do this and going to do that and going to you know and he just led me through this and just really helped and so uh, now it looks decent uh, we got it sheet rocked on the inside we need to do some mud and taping and painting and uh, but a guy was coming to our church for just three weeks and I had known him for years. He'd kind of pop into church a little bit and then pop back out for a few years, pop in for three weeks and pop out for a few years, that kind of a thing. And But he was in church when we bought the building, uh, and he said, you know, what, what do you need? Well, I didn't know what he meant by that because some folks say, what do you need, and they want to pray for you. Some folks want to, you know, they, they, you know, maybe they can help you with a day labor or something like that. And somebody else might have some money to do something. Just you don't know what they're asking for. And I said, I, I don't know what you mean. No, what does the building need? I said, it needs everything. But uh, he said, no, really. I said, well, it needs a new roof. That is one thing we cannot afford to do, but it needs a new roof. And he said, I'll bring a, uh, a roofer and have him take a look at it. 
So he came and took an est made an estimate. And then uh, he said, well, he's going to go, we're going to buy the sheets. And I said, but how much do the sheets cost? I didn't want to get stuck with a bill that we could not pay. And uh, he said, uh, no, 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 I'm going to take care of the materials. Well, that's wonderful. I said, but how much is his labor, him and his crew? He said, I'm going to take care of that too. Really? Bring him on, buddy. Bring him on. So that old building's got a brand new roof on it, and uh, praise the Lord for that. And do you know by the time they finish that roof, that guy has not been back in church? He has not been back. And then a few weeks after that, his wife called me. She was so upset. And I've known him for years. But, uh, and I said, Stephanie, how you doing? She said, I'm not doing too well. I said, I'm sorry, what's, what's wrong? She said, my husband went and spent a whole bunch of money and I'm seeing receipts for roofing and all this kind of stuff. I thought they had been talking back and forth about all of this. She never knew. Uh, and uh, I said, I'm sorry, I thought you all had talked. That's the way he spoke. And they, he put a brand new roof on our church. She said, no, I had no idea. She had come to the States for medical care, and that's when he did this. Uh, can you imagine that? Anyway, uh, so I'm thanking God for the roof. You can't really take it away. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Praise the Lord. And anyway, God has been good. October was our anniversary month for the church. Uh, we went to Barbados in January of 2004. We had spent eight, uh, nine and a half years in Nigeria. And uh, my wife's got a lot of different health problems. Uh, she's got arthritis and fibromyalgia, and she's uh, diabetic, and she has a uh, adrenal gland, just all these different things that come around. She's got them all. Uh, and so we eventually left Nigeria, and we were looking for a modern place to go where we could still minister, but we wanted to be out. Uh, we still wanted to be missionaries. And Barbados is not America, that is true. Uh, but we do have electricity, we do have running water, and do have grocery stores, but when I walk into your grocery store, just like, wow, this is cool. <laughs> we were in Wendy's the other day, my wife and I, and, uh, you know, they got, you've seen the machines, you can just touch the screen and get Dr. Pepper, Cherry Dr. Pepper, Diet Cherry Dr. Pepper, Diet Cherry Dr. Pepper with lemon on it. I mean, just all that kind of stuff. We're just going like, I just want to play with the machine. <laughs> I don't need anything to drink. I just want to touch the button. <laughs> this is like, this is cool. <laughs> so much, so much fun there. But uh, anyway, so all right, we started our church in January 2004. I know not January, but we moved there January 2004, began having services in our home in May of that year. We started with Wednesday night services. Then in June that year, we added Sunday night services. Then the first Sunday of August, we added Sunday morning services. And uh, <clears throat> Lord was good. We had, you know, had people coming and things. Not a lot of people, but people coming. We did have our first anniversary, we had 133 people in our house. That was an incredible experience and just a wonderful day for the Lord. And we thought everybody had left. I walked back inside the house and there's a guy in the kitchen. He's in my fridge. He's going, hey, preacher, I want some of that uh, <laughs> from my refrigerator. It's like, oh, that's okay, brothers. The church is over. You can go home now. Uh, <laughs> but... Uh, we moved in, we were in the house uh, with the church for about two years, and then uh, a old school opened up, and we were renting there for Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, and every other Tuesday night for a men's prayer meeting, and we were there for 13 years. The school was an old building. They don't have school there anymore, uh, but uh, I'd be preaching, and, and just where we would have the auditorium area, they had plywood on the ceiling for that, and you'd notice little droppings on the chair next to you because there's termites everywhere. So while they're eating, the dust is gathering in your hair. And so after a while, you'd realize that chair gets a lot of it, that chair gets a lot of it. So those chairs would stay open, you know, and visitors would come, oh, we have a seat for you right over here, you know. 
<laughs> with people there because regular folks are not going to sit right there, that kind of a thing. And sometimes I get frustrated because the, the, and the other half of the building, where, where, the, where the auditorium is, they had the plywood on the ceiling. And, but the other parts were just open rafters. And I'd be preaching away, you know, and I'd see the people's eyes and they're no longer watching me and they're going like this and they're going like that. They're watching the rats in the rafters. Can you imagine? How do you compete with a rat when you're preaching? I mean, really, it's really tough. I'm over here, folks. Uh huh, thank you. You know, they're just. Because <laughs> to them, it's like, you know, it was like a television show in the middle of, te- in the middle of uh, preaching there, you know, just a lot of fun. And so, but we were in that school for about for 13 years and then came out uh, the end of March of this year. I kind of felt like Moses and the children of Israel were coming out of Egypt. Hallelujah. And uh, whatnot. But uh, we, had, we, we uh, had our first organizational service uh, that was the end of October in 2004. And uh, so we kind of put our starting of our church to that date. And <clears throat> Barbadian people are very nice. And it is a beautiful island. I mean, the, you see the postcards of white sandy beach, turquoise water, clear. You can just see straight through the water there and whatnot. And, uh, and they are, they, are, they are warm, friendly people, but as far as giving you their trust or creating a close relationship with you, that doesn't always happen. Uh, and it takes time. Uh, 90% of the people, 90% of the population is black. They're descendants of African slaves. About 2% is white, about 3% is Indian, and the rest is just a mix of everything. It's a small island. It's just about uh, 21 miles long and a smile wide, and you like that, 14 miles wide, that's the entire island. You can drive from, it takes us about an hour and 15 minutes, to, we live on the southeast side, right off the coast, and you, to drive to the north northern part, uh, part is about an hour and 15 minutes, been on traffic and things like that. And there's just, just under 300,000 people there. And there's churches everywhere. But if you talk to people, do you know for sure if you died today that you go to heaven? Oftentimes they'll tell you no. Well, where do you go to church? I go to so-and-so church. I go to this church or that church. They grew up in church. They've been taught all their life that depending on how good they do, they'll get into heaven. So you won't know until you get there. And I look at them and say, that's kind of a cruel God you have there. Do you know that? What if you've tried your best all your life and when you get to God, you died, and there you are in front of the pearly gates, and God says, you know, you're not coming in here because you forgot this, or you didn't do that. How will you know what you've missed until you get there? So, oh, never thought about it like that. I said, you can't change anything when you face God. Life is done. But there's a Savior in heaven that prepared for you so that you could be with him. Amen. And, uh, and so you get to witness to folks and so on. But so often because they're reserved, uh, even our folks will have difficulty having a visitor come to church. In, in October being our anniversary Sunday, uh, anniversary month, I, I was just begging the Lord, would you help our people bring people? They get discouraged when they ask and ask and ask and ask. And then their friends say, I'm coming, but they don't come, or they just won't come whatsoever. And uh, all the month of October, we had visitors every Sunday. It was just incredible. And then we run between 50 and 60 on a Sunday morning. And uh, uh, son, uh, the last Sunday of October, I got to church and people were coming and coming. We had 95 people anniversary day. Our folks were so excited. Uh, one lady during the month, she had a whole family that came with her, her neighbors. I said, that's fantastic. Uh, you know, how'd you get them to come? She says, I didn't. I'm walking out of the house. And they said, we're coming with you to church today. Really? They had gotten up early and walked over to their own church, and their own church wasn't having church, and nobody told them. So they came back home, and they said, we're not going to be all dressed up like this and not go to church. Our neighbor goes to church. We're going with her. And so on to church they came, and they came with Julianne and her family. So just a wonderful, wonderful time. 
We're home here for just uh, until December 5th. My wife had surgery, as you probably know, uh, a couple weeks ago, and uh, they took out her gallbladder, took, uh, repaired a hernia, took a mass out of her abdomen, and my wife said, is there anything else in there that needs to come out? Just pull it out while you're in there, you know? <laughs> Trying to lose weight, right? So, <laughs> so uh, she's back uh, at her mother's house right now. Her, her, her mother lives in Cherville. My parents live in Cherville. And, uh, and recuperating and slowly. So just be in prayer for her. And I'd appreciate that very, very much. Take your Bible. Turn to 1 Kings 17. <clears throat> 1 Kings 17. Uh, my daughter, Buddy, Abeka, is with us, and my son, Buddy, they're 17 to 18, my best, some of my best church workers. But my daughter wrote a fiction novel called Heroes of Levia about five young people who bind together and face danger, and they're loyal to one another and help each other and so on. And she wrote that book so that she could pay her way through Bible college when she starts attending next year. If you're interested, it's only $10. And She's got a, a two or three copies with her, but uh, I'm pretty proud of her. I mean, the cover looks kind of cool, but I wish I looked like that guy there. He looks kind of handsome. Uh, but <laughs> instead, it's just this. All right, sorry about that. <laughs> First Kings 17, and, and Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Get thee hence, and turn thee eastward. Hide thyself by the brook Cherith that is before Jordan. And it shall be that thou shalt drink of the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. So he went and did according unto the word of the Lord, and uh, for he went and dwelt by the brook Cherith that is before Jordan. And the ravens brought him bread and flesh in the morning, and bread and flesh in the evening, and it came uh, and he drank of the brook. And it came to pass after a while that the brook dried up, because there had been no rain in the land. And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Arise, get thee to Zarephath, which belongeth to Zidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. So he arose <coughs> and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, behold, the widow woman was there gathering of sticks. And he called to her and said, Fetch me, I pray thee, a little water in a vessel, that I may drink. And as she was going to fetch it, he called to her and said, Bring me, I pray thee, a morsel of bread in thine hand. And she said, As the Lord thy God liveth, I have not a cake, but a, hand, <clears throat> a handful of meal in a barrel, and a little oil in a cruise. Behold, I am gathering two sticks, that I may go in and dress it for me and my son, that we may eat it and die. And Elijah said unto her, Fear not, go and do as thou hast said. But make me thereof a little cake first, and bring it unto me, and after make for thee and for thy son. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, The barrel of meal shall not waste, neither shall the cruse of oil fail, until the day that the Lord sendeth rain upon the earth. She went and did according to the saying of Elijah, and she and he and her house did eat many days. The barrel of meal wasted not, neither did the cruise of oil fail, according to the word of the Lord, which he spake by Elijah. Let us pray, shall we? Heavenly Father, thank you for faithful people. Lord, they faithfully provide for their missionaries, for this church, for their families. Lord, thank you for diligence in the work of God. I pray that you would bless them in their homes, in their businesses. And Lord, I pray that you'd come and be with us today during the message. I ask in Jesus' name, amen. There's so many things in this passage, and it's a familiar story to most of us, if not all of us. Uh, anybody not know this story? You've not read this before or heard this before? It's very familiar, isn't it? It's kind of an amazing story there. These were very dark days for the land of Israel. Very dark days. Ahab is king, and there has been, there's a lot of idolatry. There's a lot of violence going on. Uh, you don't find people openly serving the Lord or worshiping him. They are worshiping Baal 
or other idols that go along with it. You know, and oftentimes in our world today, uh, people don't believe that what you believe affects how you behave, but it does. If we teach our children that they're just, they've just come from animals and that they have evolved, there is no God and there is no right and wrong, they will behave as if there is no God and if there is no right and wrong. But there is a God in heaven, amen? And he did make us, and that is how we got here. And he did make some laws to help us get along with both him and each other. And it makes a world of difference. But it was a very, very dark time for them, and that's how Elijah comes on the scene. We know nothing of his past except that he's from the land of Gilead. And if you want an interesting Bible study, look at some of the important things that have happened in the land of Gilead. I won't take time for that this morning, but it's just kind of phenomenal. First time you read about that, you read of it in Jacob's life. And he stands before Ahab. Here's a man of God facing an evil and wicked king. And he says to him, as the Lord God before whom I stand liveth, there'll be no dew or no rain until I say so. What a prophecy. I can't imagine standing up and saying that. I'd be watching it rain the next day, you know. <laughs> so like, all right, I guess I should try something different. You know? <laughs> but what incredible faith. And, of course, you read about some of that uh, as how he controlled the weather through something called prayer. You read about it in James chapter 5. For three and a half years, the prayers of Elijah held rain from the earth. No dew and no rain. Can I ask you a question? What is in there, what is in your life that needs to be accomplished that is far too great for you to accomplish? And you've tried everything and just a little side of prayer. Maybe prayer should become the main thing. Am I making sense to you? I mean, they're worried about climate change and everything's going to end in 11 years and all that kind of stuff, and we'll be around to tell them, hey, we're still here. But if you want to see somebody who could control the weather, you talk to Elijah. And he did it on his knees. He stopped the rain, and he restarted it three and a half years later. He had nothing. He had no science. He had no weather program. He had nothing but prayer. Prayer can do anything God can do. Amen? And your life may have giant problems that you cannot overcome. Prayer can. And you may have issues that you do not understand and do not know how to form in your mind so you can comprehend them, so that you can get through them. But prayer can. It will bring you the wisdom of God. It can bring you the power of God. It can bring you the help of God. It can do for you what nothing else can do. We can be involved in politics. We can elect the best people we know to do the jobs of those you know, that need to be done. But they cannot do what you can do in your prayer closet. You might say, hey, I don't have, you know, I, I'm not a great Christian as people count great Christians. If you look at the prayer promises in the scripture, they are so varied and so vast. There is something there for anybody who wants to get on their knees and say, God, I need help from you. Right. It's good for a young person. It's good for a child. It's good for adults. You know, I used to look and as a teenager, read my Bible and look at all the prayer promises there. And, you know, this one talks about faith and this one talks about righteousness and this one talks about perseverance and this one talks about all these different qualifications for these different promises. And I thought, I'll never get a promise answered. I can't do all those things. That's not me. And one day, listen to Brother Hiles preach, it dawned on me. It's not all of those things I have to accomplish find me one promise that suits me. I can get in the door with that. 
I tell my church people, I envision heaven as God having a giant treasure house. There's so many things he wants to provide for us, to give us, whether it be wisdom or leadership or help in our Christian life, and sometimes money and a job. And he's got a great big doorway there to get in. And if you don't think you can fit in the front door, go climb in the back window. He doesn't care. Just find your way in. He's got promises that abound. Maybe you've got a lot of faith. Find promises with faith. Maybe you're faithful or persevering. Then find promises with that. Maybe you can just bug him to death. He doesn't mind. Because everyone that asketh receiveth. And he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be open. And sometimes I grab a hold of that very promise and say, Lord, I don't know if I'm fit for anything else, but I can ask, and I can keep on knocking until I get somewhere with you. And he doesn't mind being bugged. Amen? When my kids were small, they would ask and ask and ask. And ask, and ask, and ask. We finally put a rule on the fridge. Once you've asked, if you've gotten an answer, if you ask again, you lose that answer. You lose permission to do whatever you were about to do. I couldn't take all the asking. <laughs> but God is never that way. You can bug him and ask him from now as long as you want. You will not bother him. He has all the time in the world for you. Amen? And you might think, well, you know, I'm really a backslidden Christian. I'm really not where God would want me to be. I'm really not doing all the things that I know I ought to be doing. I've got sin in my life. I've got this. I've got that. There's no way he's going to answer me. The promises are true, every one of them. And God's got a little secret the more you have to come to him, the more you become like him. Amen. <laughs> I love it. He is an awesome, awesome God. I want to take just the next few moments and show you one other thing if I can. Not only did Elijah literally control the weather, the rain, the dew, by nothing more than prayer. And you can affect your life and the life of others for good and for God through prayer. And the life of your nation, too. And our nation needs prayer, does it not? But there's something else I want to show you, if I could. As we look over here at the story of the widow at Zarephath, and Elijah comes, <clears throat> verse 8, And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Arise, get thee to Zarephath, which belongeth to Zidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. God had already told her, Elijah's coming. Be looking for the man of God. And when he comes, you will take care of him. You will feed him. You will house him. You'll sustain him. He's your responsibility. And the implication here is the widow woman is quite happy to do so. She has no problem with that. I don't know, in my mind, I just kind of envisioned, because it, it took time. You know, he was at the brook until the brook dried up. And all this time, she's been waiting on the preacher to show up. He may have been on Caribbean time, I'm not sure. <laughs> but <clears throat> she's there, and maybe when God first told her this, she said, yes, Lord, I have no problem with she checks her pantry, the cupboards are full, the shelves are full. We're good. Lord, I'm ready for the man of God. Send him. I am prepared. And the days began to pass, no man of God. And the weeks began to pass. And the pantry began to diminish. And the shelves began to clear. Till finally, the man of God has just never come. And all she has left is a little bit of meal, a little bit of flour. She's going to make, they call it a cake, a piece of bread. We're going to make one piece of bread. We're going to split it and eat it. And then we're going to die. 
And at that point in time, she sees the man of God walking down the street looking for her. I don't know how he was going to find her. Seems like Elijah was pretty familiar to a lot of people. I mean, <clears throat> when others ask about him, you know, who was that? How was he dressed? He had a leather girdle. He was a hairy man. Oh, that had to be Elijah. Pretty easy to spot him. She sees him walking down the street. Can you imagine her heart? Lord, why now? Why didn't you send him when I had food months ago? I was prepared. I told you yes. And I still tell you yes. And she took that little cake and she made that and she gave that to Elijah. And she fed him and God fed her and her son and her household every day until the famine was done and the crops returned. She could not exercise faith until Elijah exercised faith by coming, looking for the widow. And Elijah's faith, he was fed because she exercised faith. And when she exercised faith, she was fed too. Am I making sense to you? In life, in the spiritual realm, in God's world, we are commanded to do this. Pay your tithe. Lord, how do I pay a tithe? I don't have enough for the rest. I don't have enough for my bills as it is. What do you mean pay my tithe? And God says, pay your tithe. And so you pay your tithe because you love the Lord. And you're thinking, Lord, this just doesn't make sense. Uh, you know, I couldn't pay my bills. And you're asking me to give. Yes, pay your tithe. And then you find this bill diminishes. Extra work is available here. And things happen all the way through. A few years ago, we were there in Barbados, and you know our missionary support comes in a lump sum, and we'll count off our tithe and our missions and our giving, things like that, and we pay that. And I had that month, and I had put it in an envelope so we could pay it on Sunday. And I went to find that envelope, and I couldn't find it. It's like, oh no. I searched the house. I told my wife, I said, I can't, I cannot, I know I put it in an envelope. I know I put it someplace where we could find it, but I can't find it anywhere. Like you, we live on a fairly tight budget. It was going to take her grocery money to pay our tithe again. I looked at her and she looked at me and she said, let's do it. We took her grocery money, put that in there tithe, our missions, our offerings, they're paid, and we have no money for food. I told the Lord two things. I want you to do two things for me. One, I, I know you'll feed us somehow. We always have food. But Lord, when money's short, my temper gets short because I'm nervous. I want this to be a month of peace. Would you believe we always had food? We never missed a single meal. Things, different things happen, and all of a sudden. And would you also believe that we had a wonderful month of peace? There was no agitation in my heart. I don't know if you've ever been like that. You got a big bill coming, and everything is short. Nothing's adding up, and you get do you get agitated, or am I the only one like that? Anybody else like that? That's how I'm always am like that, especially when money is short or tight. It can, Peace, a whole month. Calmness in the house, calmness with me and my heart, calmness for my wife and my children. I got done with that and I thought, Lord, let's do that again. It's one of the best months we've ever had. That was a wonderful month. You will not find what you need until you step out in faith as he commands you to. And when you step out in faith, you'll find everything you need. It doesn't all just pile in on you. It's just kind of a little bit here. There's a little bit of manna every day. It's absolutely unbelievable. She got everything she needed by giving away what she had. Just because the Lord said, this is what I want. For whatever reason, he waited until that was it. That's all she had. And then he let the man of God show up. Because he didn't tell Elijah where to go until the brook was dry. 
He made him wait there. Elijah exercised faith. She exercised faith. And because they both exercised faith, they blessed each other and they fed each other. You exercise faith as you pay your tithes and offerings and you give to missions and you support this missionary and others and people are saved and people are helped. I cannot be on the field of, without churches like you. And you cannot see people saved out there without people like us. And we exercise faith to go and you exercise faith to be faithful and to give. And God blesses both of us. The physical needs you have you'll find them an answer to stepping out by faith. Now, I don't know what that means for you. I can see what it meant for her, and I've seen the different times in my life when I had to step out in faith. But it may be that God is calling you, speaking to you. Maybe there's somebody here that God wants to go to the mission field, and you're terrified. Just say yes. Just say yes. These men will guide you. And you'll learn faith and you'll get there. It may be that God is speaking to you about something else. I have no idea how he's speaking to you. But you'll find your answers when you step out in faith. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Then we'll turn the service over.